Well, that's the broad outline of the structure, and we'll have a look at it again in a moment. But first, let's take a closer look and see how we build such a structure up. Well, we start at the end and we, with the result that we want to prove, and we work backwards. Now, we know that if we have an antiderivative theorem, then Cauchy's theorem is not too difficult to prove. Remember, an antiderivative was a function at capital F such that F dashed is equal to our analytic function F. And then the fundamental theorem tells us that this integral is just the value of capital F at some point on the contour minus the value of capital F at the end point, which is the same point because it's a closed contour, and the result is obviously zero. So if we have an antiderivative theorem, well, then we're home and dry. Now, for a star region, it's not too difficult to get an antiderivative. If we take some star uh, z naught, then we know that we can reach any other point z in this region by a straight line. And we go ahead and define our antiderivative capital F of z to be the integral along this line segment from z naught to z of our function. Now, for a simply connected region, if we have some point here, z naught, then we can't reach every other point. For instance, we can't reach this point here, z, by means of a straight line segment, because part of the li straight line doesn't lie in the region. So in order to get an antiderivative theorem for a simply connected region, we have to make some sort of adjustment. Well, we can't use a straight line, so what we do is we use the next best thing, a polygonal line, something like that. And then we go ahead and we define our antiderivative f of z to be the integral along this polygonal line of our function f. OK? So now someone else comes along and says, well, I don't want to use that polygonal line. I want to use this one. And he draws a second one something like that, and he defines his antiderivative in terms of the integral along the second polygonal line. So now we have the possibility of two answers for our antiderivative capital F. You see, in a star region, that didn't occur, because there's only one way that you can draw a straight line between two points, and so the antiderivative is unique. Now, that's what we want for the simply connected region. So in other words, we want the integral along one polygonal line joining two points, to always be equal to the integral along any second polygonal line joining the same two points. So we want to prove this. If we take the integral out along one polygonal path, then this must be minus the integral back along the other polygonal path. In other words, the integral around this whole closed polygon must be zero. So our next step to prove an antiderivative theorem for a simply connected region is to show that the integral around this closed polygon is zero. Well, how do we do that? Well, we simply pull the polygon to bits. Now, if you look at this bit here, if you look at the arrows, you'll see that all we have to do is show that the integral around the simple polygon is zero. Well, that's quite difficult to do. Now, are there any bits of the polygon we can do quite easily? Well, if we look at this double line, that's just simply the integral from this point to that point and then back again. So the result's obviously zero. And I can throw this bit away. Now, are there any other bits we can do? Well, there's some triangles, and we know Cauchy's theorem for a triangle. So we know that the integral around this triangle is zero, and I can get rid of that piece as well. And I've got another triangle here that I can get rid of. So that all I'm left with are these simple polygons. And I want to show that 
the integral around this simple polygon is zero. Well, how do I do that? I just triangulate. And that's the final step. What we've done is we've reduced the integral around the simple polygon to the sum of integrals around a triangle. And once again, we have Cauchy's theorem for a triangle so that we know each of these integrals is zero. So that's the, the uh, proof for the general version of Cauchy's theorem. And now that we've seen the details, let's have a second look at the structure diagram. We start with Cauchy's theorem for a triangle. We know this from unit five. The triangulation lemma says that we can triangulate simple polygons. So Cauchy's theorem also applies to simple polygons. Then we have the decomposition result. Any closed polygon can be decomposed into lots of simple polygons. So Cauchy's theorem also applies to arbitrary closed polygons. Now we know that we can define an antiderivative function which won't depend on the polygonal line we choose. And finally, we can apply the fundamental theorem to get the result we wanted, that the integral of an analytic function round any contour in a simply connected region is zero. So that's the full proof structure for the general version of Cauchy's theorem. Now for the rest of the program, I want to look at a result from the first section on unit nine, and that's the maximum principle that I mentioned at the beginning of the program. Now this is one of the many consequences of Cauchy's theorem. And when you first look at the statement, it's not at all obvious what's going on. But there's quite a good geometrical interpretation of the statement of the result. So let's have a look at the statement. The modulus of the function has a maximum on the boundary. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's our region R, and our function F maps every point Z in this region to some complex number. But we're not interested in the function F, we're interested in the modulus of F. And this function maps every point Z to some real number. So let's put the real line in here. Then the modulus function maps this point Z 
to the real number, the modulus of f of z. And we get a whole lot of real numbers for all points z in the region. Now, the maximum principle says that there's some point on the boundary, say this point here, that the modulus function maps to a maximum value. Now, we can get a good geometrical idea of what's going on if we simply lift this real axis out of the plane of the paper and put it down at right angles to the complex plane. So we've got this sort of setup. We've got a three-dimensional space. Now, for each point z in the region, we measure off a distance mod of f of z and get this point up here. And when we do that for all the points in the region, we build up this surface. Now, the maximum principle says that the, the highest point on the surface will occur on the edge. What we can't have is the highest point occurring somewhere in the middle of the region, like that. The maximum principle says we can't have that. So what we need now is a formal definition of what we mean by maximum. Well, we say that a, uh, the point alpha is a maximum if the modulus of f of alpha is always greater than or equal to the modulus of f of z for all z in the region. Now, that's an overall maximum. Now, what we also can't have is a little bump occurring in the middle. We can't have a little bump like that occurring. You see, this is a local maximum. It's not an overall maximum, but it's local in the sense that we can find a small disk around this bump, such that on this disk, the bump is an overall maximum. But we can't have the little bump occurring because that would be breaking the overall maximum principle for the small disk. You see, the conditions on the function f haven't changed for the small disk. Now, in order to prove the maximum principle, we must first prove the local maximum principle. That is, we must show that a function f cannot have a local maximum at a point in the region. Unless, of course, f is constant, in which case every point inside the region has a local maximum. So let's start by supposing that f does have a local maximum at some point inside the region. And so here's our region. There's a point alpha, which is the local maximum. That means we can find a small disk around alpha, such that for that disk, mod of f of alpha is always greater than or equal to the mod of f of z for all z in that disk. So now we suppose that we have a local maximum at alpha. What we want to try and show is that this means that f is constant on our region r. And we'll do that by first of all showing that this means that mod f is constant on this disk. Now, all we've got to work with is this inequality. And the trick that we use is to notice that the point z inside the disk can always be written in the form alpha plus r e to the i theta. So our inequality becomes mod of f of alpha is greater than or equal to the mod of f of alpha plus r e to the i theta. And now what we want to prove is that mod of f of alpha is always equal to mod of f of z for all z in the disk. First, we use Gauss's mean value theorem, which was a result from the first unit on Cauchy's theorem. This expresses f of alpha in terms of the integral of f of alpha plus r e to the i theta. Then we take the modulus of both sides. So we've got the modulus of an integral. We want to express it as the integral of a modulus. But that's just the estimation result from the unit on integration. Now we've got the integral of something we've seen before. Because alpha is a local maximum, 
we know that what we're integrating, mod of f alpha plus r e to the i theta, is less than or equal to mod f of alpha. But now, mod f of alpha is a constant. It's independent of theta. So its integral from naught to 2 pi is just 2 pi mod f of alpha. And the 2 pi's cancel. We get mod f of alpha. But just think where we started. Mod f of alpha. We have mod f of alpha equals something, which is less than or equal to something, which is less than or equal to something, which equals mod f of alpha again. So all these middle terms are squeezed between mod f of alpha and itself. So they've all got to be equal to mod f of alpha, and therefore equal to each other. Now just look at these two terms. We obtained these because alpha was a local maximum. But now we know they're equal. We can cancel the two pi's, and then we know that the integral of mod f of alpha plus r e to the i theta equals the integral of mod f of alpha. And we want to show that the things we're integrating are equal, because then we'll be able to show that f is constant. Now, how can we do that? We'll start by rearranging. We get this integral equal to zero, but look at what we're integrating. Alpha, we know, is a local maximum. So what we're integrating, mod f of alpha minus mod f of alpha plus r e to the i theta, must be greater than or equal to zero. Now remember, this integral is a real integral, just like the area under a curve. And if we're integrating a real function greater than or equal to zero, how can the integral possibly be zero? Well, only if the function itself is zero for all theta. That's just from real analysis, because the functions are continuous. And there we have our result. Mod f alpha and mod of f alpha plus r e to the i theta are equal. So now we're almost there. We have that mod f is constant on the disk. Now we need a result from the unit on differentiation, which tells us that this implies that f is constant on the disk. And finally, we need a result from the Taylor series that tells us that this implies that f is constant on the whole region R. So if f has a maximum value at a point inside the region, then it's constant on that region. In other words, if f is not constant on the region, then it cannot have a maximum value at some point inside the region. And that's the local maximum principle. Now, we use that to deduce the maximum principle, but the proof of that is quite intricate, and we won't go into that here. You might like to try and draw the proof diagram for that for yourselves.